Ever find yourself kind of wrestling with that age-old question? You know, the one about whether everyone, and I mean everyone, can be saved. It's a big one. It really is. Centuries, theologians and philosophers have been going back and forth on it, and today we're taking a deep dive into this whole debate, looking at two big players in Christian thought, provisionism and Calvinism. And it's way more than just some abstract theological puzzle, right? These viewpoints are like lenses, yeah. you know, shaping how people understand some pretty fundamental things, how God shows love, how God meets out justice, and what it means for them to find their own, well, salvation. It's amazing how these beliefs, they really get under the hood of how we see things. Crumbling in his hands, but the potter never gives up. He has a perfect plan. He reshapes the broken pieces with patience and with skill. And what was once discarded now reflects his perfect will. On the pause, we were spinning round and round and round through the fire and the pressure. So let's break down these two perspectives, starting with provisionism. Imagine, if you will, a massive ceased. I'm talking huge spread, right? Provisionists, they'd say the table's set, it's overflowing with God's grace, everyone's invited, no exceptions. The choice, though, it's on us. Pull up a chair, dig in, or just walk away. Love that analogy. It really captures it. And, you know, they even have this super handy acronym, PROVIDE, to help remember the core tenets. An acronym, huh? Now you're speaking my language. Tell me more. What's it stand for? So each letter it represents a key concept. We've got people sin, meaning, well, we all fall short. Then there's responsible, highlighting our ability to actually answer when God calls. Open door, that one signifies God's offer of salvation being accessible to, well, anyone and everyone. Then we've got vicarious atonement, meaning Christ's sacrifice was enough for everyone. Illuminating grace, that means God, he makes truth clear, you know, so we can actually respond. Then there's destroyed for rejecting God. That one speaks to the consequence of, well, rejecting that offer. And lastly, we've got eternal security for those who do believe. Wow, okay, that's a mouthful. But comprehensive, I'll give it that. Seems to really put a lot of emphasis on, well, us, human action, you know, in this whole salvation thing. 100%. Provisionists, they put a ton of stock in free will. It's a gift from God, they say letting us really and truly choose him or, well, not. So it's empowering in a way. We've got a say in how things turn out, at least when it comes to our destiny. But what about the other side of the coin? What happens when we shift gears and look at the Calvinist take on all this? Calvinism, it takes a different route. Instead of this open invitation, picture a spotlight shining bright, right? And that spotlight, it represents God's grace. But here's the thing, that spotlight, it's fixed, laser focused on a specific group, the elect. They're the ones predestined for salvation. So instead of choosing to step into the light, you're either in it from the get-go or you're not. No in-between. That's the heart of it. Yep. Calvinists, they believe in this idea called total depravity. Basically, it means humanity's, well, we're so messed up by sin that we can't even choose God on our own. We're utterly incapable. We need irresistible grace, that spotlight you mentioned, to even, you know, want a relationship with him. Total depravity and irresistible grace, big words, big concepts. I have to admit, they definitely paint a different picture. Help me wrap my head around this a bit more. Okay, it's like, imagine a ship lost at sea, totally adrift, navigation systems fried. There's absolutely zero chance it finds its way back to shore without a powerful beacon guiding it. Is that sort of what we're talking about with total depravity? That is a fantastic way to put it. See, Calvinists, they'd argue that sin, it's so deeply ingrained, you know, it's permeated our very being that we're just like that lost ship, adrift, rudderless, no way to turn things around on our own. We're totally, completely reliant on God making the first move, his irresistible grace to reel us in. Okay, that makes sense. So with provisionism, it's like this open invitation, a choice we make. With Calvinism, it's more, well, predetermined, a spotlight we can't escape, can't even switch on ourselves. Feels like we're zeroing in on the core tension here, human free will versus, I guess, God's ultimate control, his sovereignty. You nailed it. And this, this is where things get really interesting because both sides, they point to the same source, the Bible, to back up their views. Take, for example, John 3.16, right? Provisionists, they'll often quote that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That whoever does seem, well, pretty open and shut. It's like a universal welcome mat. You know, no restrictions. Exactly. Provisionists, they put a lot of weight on that whosoever. That open door policy extended to 
every single person. They might also point to verses like Titus 2.01, talking about God's grace appearing, offering salvation to all people, no strings attached. But I'm guessing Calvinists, they might have a slightly different take on those same verses, wouldn't they? You're right on the money. They might say the world doesn't necessarily equal like every single individual, yeah. but rather refers to a broader scope, maybe something like, you know, the world of both Jews and Gentiles together. It all boils down to how you frame it, how you interpret it. So it's like both sides are pulling from the same playbook, you yeah. know, finding ammunition for their perspectives in the same text. It's wild. It really is. It's like they're both looking at this intricate tapestry, but their eyes are drawn to different threads, different patterns. Absolutely. And this whole interpretive dance, it extends way beyond just those verses, mm -hmm. right? Like Calvinists, I know they often point to Romans 9, especially that line in verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Heavy stuff. No kidding. That one's a cornerstone for the Calvinist view, that's for sure. It really drives home their emphasis on God's sovereignty when it comes to, well, who gets saved. Hmm. They might also bring up verses like John 6.44, where Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That, for Calvinists, that's God taking the reins. It's not about us choosing him, but the other way around, him making the first move, choosing us. So we're essentially talking about two completely different dances here, aren't we? In one, we're boldly stepping onto the dance floor, choosing our moves. And in the other, it's more like we're being swept up in this divine waltz, guided by a force we can't control, almost like we're, well, predestined for that dance. I like that. And the thing is, this difference, this whole perspective shift, it impacts everything. How people live out their faith, what it means to them. It's huge. Think about it. If you truly believe deep down that God has like, handpicked you, singled you out for salvation, it's got to evoke an incredible sense of gratitude, a purpose. Right. Like you've been chosen for a reason. I can see that. But wouldn't it also, I don't know, maybe create a certain kind of pressure too? Like, whoa, God's got this whole amazing plan for me. I better not screw it up. For sure. Some Calvinists, they talk about feeling this profound sense of humility, of responsibility, knowing their salvation. It's not their doing. It rests totally on God's grace. So their good deeds, their actions, they become a response to that grace, not a way to, like, earn it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like being handed a priceless family heirloom, right? You didn't earn it, but man, you're going to guard it with your life. A hundred percent. Now, flip over to provisionism. There's a whole different kind of weight there. They stress the freedom we have to choose God, but also, you know, the massive weight of that choice. If you reject him, knowing what's at stake, well, that's on you. You bear the full responsibility for that decision. Which I imagine could be both incredibly empowering and absolutely terrifying, right? Like you're standing at this crossroads and each path, it stretches out before you and you, you just know there are eternal consequences to whatever you choose. It's heavy stuff. And that tension that's baked into provisionism, right? It brings up these thorny questions about God's grace. If his grace really is enough for everyone, for the whole world, then why wouldn't everyone, well, choose it? Million dollar question, right? And it leads to another fascinating point of divergence, this time in how they view evangelism, the whole idea of, you know, sharing your faith with others. If, as a Calvinist, you believe that God has already chosen who's going to be saved, does that, I don't know, maybe dampen the drive to evangelize? Does it even matter? It's a question that's been bouncing around Calvinist circles for ages. Some, they say, look, we're called to share the gospel with everyone, no exceptions. We don't get to decide who's liked and who isn't, so spread the word far and wide. Others, they might focus more on living out their faith within their communities, trusting God's going to do his thing, work through them to reach those he's chosen. So it becomes less about, you know, actively trying to convert people and more about just being a living, breathing example of God's grace. Like a city on a hill, a lamp on a stand, right? illuminating the path for those God's drawing in. That's one way to look at it. Now, provisionists, on the other hand, with their big emphasis on free will, on the gospel being this open invitation to everyone, they see evangelism as, well, an act of love, a way to extend that invitation, to shout it from the rooftops. Like they've stumbled across this incredible treasure, this hidden gem, and they can't help but share it with everyone they meet. Exactly. They believe they're playing an active role in God's plan in bringing about salvation, by putting the ball in people's court, giving them the choice. And it's crucial to remember, we're dealing with big, broad frameworks here. In reality, people's beliefs, they often fall somewhere along the spectrum within these viewpoints. 
Oh, for sure. Faith's a deeply personal thing. And these are weighty issues. We're talking about stuff with no easy answers, no matter how hard we try to pin it down. You know, it really hits me. Even as we're digging into these theological frameworks, these systems, we're also kind of bumping up against something, well, deeply personal. You know, this isn't just about doctrines and, you know, theological hair splitting. It's about trying to understand these huge mysteries, God's nature, our place in the universe, the whole shebang. It's big stuff. It really is. It gets to those core questions we all grapple with mm -hmm. at some point, right? Is there someone in control? If so, how much say do we really have in any of this? No wonder these debates have been going on for centuries. And for some, the idea of predestination, this idea that God chooses some and not others, it just, well, it doesn't sit well. It feels, I don't know, maybe at odds with the whole concept of a loving God, a God who embraces everyone unconditionally. I can see that. It's a tough one to reconcile for sure. On the flip side, that weight that responsibility that's baked into provisionism, that can feel like a lot to carry too. If it all boils down to us, to our choices, and those choices have eternal consequences, well, that's a heavy burden. No kidding. And it begs the question is, if God's grace really is irresistible, like the Calvinists believe, then why isn't everyone drawn in? And if it's this open invitation, like the provisionists say, why would anyone, knowing what's on the line, ever turn away? It's a head scratcher. It's the paradox of faith, isn't yeah. it? Here we are, finite beings trying to grasp the infinite, to wrap our heads around the mind of God when we barely understand our own. It's a trip. It's like trying to chart the entire universe armed with nothing but a compass and a beat-up old map. Maybe that's why this deep dive, this exploration of provisionism and Calvinism, has been so fascinating, you know? It holds a mirror up to those profound mysteries we bump into when we really start to dig into matters of faith. We've unpacked these two viewpoints, looked at how they interpret scripture, how they shape the way people live and share their faith, and running through it all, like these common threads are these ideas of free will and God sovereignty. But in the end, we're left with something, well, it goes beyond any single system, any one theological framework. This truth that God's grace, it just explodes any box we try to put it in. These systems, they're helpful, sure, for getting a handle on things. But they're really just attempts, like your beat-up old map, to navigate a territory that's way, way bigger than we can ever fully grasp. It's humbling, isn't it, to realize how much we don't know? It is. But I think it can be kind of freeing, too, you know? How so? But it forces us to approach these questions with a little humility. To admit we don't have all the answers. To keep our minds open to different perspectives, different ways of seeing things. Maybe certainty, that's not something we find in this life. Maybe it's okay to hold these big questions lightly, you know, with open hands, open hearts. I get that. So where does all this leave you, dear listener? Maybe it sparks something, rekindles that curiosity about these age-old questions. Maybe it gives you a better handle on your own beliefs or even helps you understand why others see things so differently. Or maybe, just maybe, it leaves you with a sense of awe, you know, at the vastness of God's grace, at how beautifully complex faith can be. Whatever you take away from this deep dive, from this exploration, we encourage you don't let it end here. Keep seeking, keep those questions coming, and keep wrestling with these mysteries. Because they're at the heart of it all, you know, the heart of what it means to be human. Until next time, happy pondering, everyone.
Fight strength, feel the pace, we'll never fall.